This week on The Cruising Kiwis, Rob records his family history for Becky or Jenison's death dialogues. No, I haven't got a problem talking about it. I've got plenty to say about it. I've had a lot of experience with it. It was a really strange time. I was um, 14 at the time when he went missing. Grief. Grief. Took over. Huge amount of grief. Yes. On the afternoon of the 13th, we thought we could hear a boat engine at intervals throughout the afternoon, but we couldn't be sure. Suddenly a boat came in closer. I was about to go up on deck when the boat opened fire and sent some shots over our mast. I am deeply honoured and moved to be here today, given the opportunity to speak. I realise that this is a privilege made available to a few, especially compared to the numbers of families that suffered under the Khmer Rouge regime. I arrived in Cambodia last week. Last Thursday, 13th of August, was coincidentally 31 years to the day that my brother, Kerry Hamill, first set foot on Cambodian soil. This is the story of an innocent man brought to his knees and killed in the prime of his life and the impact his death had on just one family. Hello, Becky. Hi. Now, tell us, why are we here? Why am I filming you? So you have <coughs> kindly agreed to come and be interviewed in the Little Red Shed. Little Red Shed. For um, the Death Dialogues Project yep. podcast. So what we're about is getting conversations about death, dying, and the aftermath out of the closet, into the light. Our, our cultures have for too long skipped over death and dying. and yep. I was told by my good friend, Jane Cunningham, that you are a male that does not do that because I'm having a hard time finding male voices. Oh, really? Seriously? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Didn't know that. Yeah, no, I haven't got a problem talking about it. I've got plenty to say about it. I've had a lot of experience with it. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, no, happy to do this. So this is a lovely place. So, yeah, this is what we call Bliss Farm because everybody yep. gets up here and is quite mesmerized. Even yeah, when lovely. we were rehabbing and had workers, they Heck would yeah. be standing with their cameras. It's got some good energy here. So my story is... Um, I grew up in a town called Whakatane, spelled W-H-A-K-A-T-A-N-E, Whakatane, uh, in the eastern Bay of Plenty of New Zealand. Uh, my mother and father had five children, four boys, one daughter, and um, I guess my getting straight into it, my immediate connection for being here, reason for being here is I have had a number of uh, deaths and close family members, and uh, the first being my eldest brother, Kerry who was uh, a sailor in the 70s. He was doing the OE, the overseas experience, and he was intending to sail the seven seas. And he had been sailing for nearly a year on a, on a 28-foot double-ended sloop. She was a Malaysian-built um, wooden fishing boat, uh, but a sailing boat. He was um, getting by doing paid work, kind of charters, day trips, weekend trips, up to two, three weeks at, at a time sometimes. And um, on one particular fateful voyage, he was taking a charter from a um, place near Singapore up to Bangkok. And this is in 1978. And they got blown off course and ended up in Cambodian waters. It was Kampuchea at the time. Uh, they were taking shelter behind an island about 50 kilometres offshore called Koh Tang Island. Little did they know actually on the other side of that island was a Khmer Rouge naval gun base and uh, that evening they were attacked by a gunboat. Uh, Kerry's friend, a Canadian, Stuart Glass, was killed in that time um, and Kerry along with the charter, uh, an Englishman, John Dewhurst, 
were taken prisoner back to Tulsling Prison in Phnom Penh, uh, the capital, uh, where they were tortured for a couple of months, mm. um, forced to sign confessions to being uh, CIA, and were then executed. Um, and for our, for our family, we didn't know what had happened for quite some time, uh, a long time. It was about um, 16 months, in fact, when we found out the news. So sorry. Yeah, it was, it was terrible for mum and dad. It was, you know, they were beside themselves. They didn't know. Yeah, you know, we were, you know, it was, uh, it was, a, it was a really strange time. I was um, 14 at the time when he went missing. And so for a 16-month period, I had my 15th and 16th birthdays during that time. Um, and still no word from a big bro, you know, it was a really strange thing because he, he wrote letters to us vicariously. We lived by his adventures through those beautiful letters and we read them at night, you know, and and, uh, and they just stopped. And mm. and of course, Dad was writing around the ports of the area. You know, no, no, nothing, nothing. So mum and dad have their grief and then their youngest boy. I was the only one living at home at the time, oh. Peter and Sue. John were off doing their things um, and so I went off the rails a little bit and uh, alcohol was my crutch and uh, you know I'd get back, you know, I was 15, 15 you know, I was getting back at you know, school like, uh, school nights, I'd get home at very late after they were in bed and drunk and you know, and a regular occurrence and um, fortunately my saviour was sport, uh, I was very very active and um, at the time in my school years it was volleyball and I just couldn't do anything but play volleyball or drink. After I left school, I was at a real loss though. I was really, really unhappy. And I remember lying in bed at night, I was I'm so unhappy, I'm so miserable. Um, and because the volleyball thing had finished school, after school there was nothing really in the local town in Whakatane. And uh, I randomly on one night on the booze, and I said, I'm going for a row tomorrow, do you want to come along? And it kind of changed my life. I got I very quickly began to enjoy it. I, I was pretty good at it and, um, and went on to, you know, Rode for New Zealand with, some, with moderate success, won a few medals on the world stage, world champs and whatnot. So Kerry was a, you know, a big part of our family um, for mum and dad and, um, and you know, it was a big blow for them, huge mm -hmm. blow. It was interesting for me observing now in reflection how they coped and sometimes didn't cope with that, that uh, loss and, um, and uh, my mother in particular. I never saw my mother grieve. I never saw her cry. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 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 And um, the thing there with, you know, having no body to grieve over. Yes. And you never <clears> did <throat> have his body back. No, no, no. We never found him. Can I ask, I'm sorry, mm. just for clarification. So when, how long was he missing before you, you all understood what had months. happened? Yeah. And so how did you find out? Well, my memory was reading in the a headline in the newspaper. You're joking. Of his capture and torture. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> yeah. So the the um, oh. what actually happened in the history of the time? Of course, it was Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge uh, was in control of Cambodia or Democratic Kampuchea, it was then as it was then called. And the Vietnamese actually invaded uh, Cambodia or Kampuchea uh, in early 1979. Uh, probably less than a month or two max after Kerry had been executed, mm -hmm. we think. Um, and they came into the streets of Phnom Penh, which of course was a desert city. They'd been everyone, everyone had been sent out into the country to grow rice, pretty much. And um, one or two places remained operational, and one was this prison, Tulsling Prison, codenamed S21. And uh, here were these remains of dead and recently killed people because of course the uh, guards and the had run and um, and then later on they opened up to the Western media and they found these confessions most people had photographs taken and were made to confess to being CIA or, or KGB or yep. whatever and my brother was no exception and, and a, a journalist named Jim Laurie a US journalist uh, Jim Laurie found Kerry's confession to being CIA uh, and so he communicated with the New Zealand government and then somehow the media, I think Interpol, I don't quite know what happened, but mm. somehow, uh, I'm not sure we were informed. Wow, probably. wow. That yeah. entire 16 months, what's going through the family's head? Did you suspect? 
Did you, did you think Suspected there was... the worst, of course. You know, you can't help but think the worst, but hope the, hope for the best. I mean, mum, mum uh, that Christmas, I must have been Christmas of 78, it was August 13, 1978, they were captured. And uh, that Christmas, mum, you know, we lived at the heads of Whakatane. You look out to the sea there, you know, Kerry's going to come over the horizon mm. and surprise us and mm. tell us about all his adventures. So you didn't know, you didn't suspect a capture no, or no, anything no. like that at Thought that point? Thought shipwreck, yep. loss, you know, at sea, you know, yeah, something yeah. like that. But, you know, never the, the worst outcome. Oh my goodness, what yeah. torture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's exactly. I mean, it was, a, uh, I mean, it was a, it's an extended torture of the mind yes. and the heart and the soul and then the worst possible news. And um, John, our, my second, uh, second elder sibling, I don't know, they were, they were very close in age, probably 15 months separating them. Grew up having adventures and just an amazing playground. Mm -hmm. And then nine months after we heard the news about Kerry's demise, John took his life. Oh no! Yeah, and so mum and dad, you know, having this incredible tragedy doubled and duplicated by John's, you know, so they, they had a double whammy. Um, Can't say again the time frame from when they found out. So it was 16 months missing yes. and then nine months later. Nine months later. Oh, mm. grief. Grief. Took over. Huge amount of grief. And and you know mum, And with John, do you feel that's what precipitated this suicide? If Kerry had been with us, John would be with us. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean he had what would probably be diagnosed as bipolar. So that probably contributed, yeah, significantly, I, I would suspect. Man, I believe your family and you went through all of that. That's just I'm so Well, you so know, sorry. as a parent myself now, I understand oh. a little more about what they went through. So mum and dad, you know, they, as I say, I never saw mum cry I, throughout that entire, mm. ever, uh, not that I recall. Um, dad, yes, yes, I did, yeah. Look, it came out in their health, mum's health in particular. Two years later, she was bedridden, in great pain, shingles, mm. back, mm. everything went. You know, she was just, she was in bed for, a, I, I can't remember how long, it just, I was, you know, I was getting, going through my little thing and I hated going into a bedroom as like a morgue, you know. And I always felt guilt, I felt, and I still feel guilt about it. Because I, I wasn't there to support her, she was yeah. going through hell, absolute yeah. hell, you know. And, um, and So what you pain. saw, mm. if we could just, for our listeners to hear this, if you don't walk open heart, open mind mm. through the grief, it will come out. I think so. I think there's other, it'll come out in other ways, yeah. and I think you've got to share your pain, your grief, and share it with someone close by. And here's the thing, you know, God, I still cannot understand why the doctor allowed this to happen. But when what happened when John took his life, they had an argument, an open argument at Dad's work, shouting match, and then John took off and, oh, then, man. and went down to our, our house near our house walked around the rocks, climbed a cliff, and jumped off the cliff, yeah. right? Now, Dad and Peter, you saw the car there and the, thought the worst, retraced the steps and looked down and saw him, you know, saw his body on the bottom of the rocks. Now, terrible, you know, the most oh. stark, awful discovery, you know, after that big argument, yeah. so the blame and the yeah. guilt, my father, my, I, you know, I never talked about him, but it must have, I don't know. But the worst thing that then happened was, that night, or the night before the funeral, it must have been a hell of a night for them, mum and dad, I slept through it, but mum called the doctor around mm -hmm. in the early hours of the morning and sedated him, and sedated him through the funeral. Dad didn't even go to the bloody funeral. No. You know, his two sons he didn't have a funeral for. <laughs> oh my goodness. It did nothing to help the no. grieving process whatsoever. Mm. You've got to confront it. You can't bury it. You, you can't, can't run away. No. You just... Yeah. Oh so on John's ceremony, was there an honoring? Yeah, him? so it was an opportunity actually to say goodbye to Kerry at the same time because we had had nothing for Kerry. So the funeral was for not just John but for Kerry as well and uh, we acknowledged that and um, and on the headstone it's actually acknowledges Kerry too so he has a headstone okay. and uh, up at, in Whakatane and, um, and that's really cool. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Mm. Mm. 
so <clears throat> such a deep, big, wide stories of grief that you're carrying throughout your life, and obviously it's informed you greatly. I mean, your your movie was in large response mm. to the grief. Yeah, we made a film talking about my brother's story and the genocide of Cambodia, the kind of forgotten genocide through a film called Brother Number One. And I've been asked many times, has this brought closure, Rob? And I said, well, I don't want closure. It's, yeah. it's a nonsense. I mean, I want to, if anything, it's reinforced my bond with my brothers, you know, yeah. the, and it's strengthened that connection. And I think about it often and I, it's, I, I celebrate, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And unfortunately, our, 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 our culture kind of, reinforces that separation from the lost loved one and yeah uh, yeah so closure move through yeah get on yeah go on through the grief yeah yeah all that kind of languaging doesn't help does no it? no I, I guess if i could title this uh podcast it would be the power of symbolism and ceremony for me i believe in the power of symbolism and ceremony is incredibly um critical in, in dealing with grief and you know, we didn't have that. My parents didn't did not have that ability through our culture, through our lack of understanding of uh, of how to grieve. You know, this kind of stoic, you know, Western culture that we've been brought up in is so disparate from the truth and what we should be doing. And tell us what you mean by this: the power of symbolism. And well, as an example, yeah. and I can only use examples that I did, I discovered along the way, but. Mm. Um, when we were making the film, Brother Number One, it meant traveling to Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I did was, well, I prepared myself and I knew that I, was, I may have, there may be an opportunity. Just to add to that, I ended up testifying in the War Crimes Tribunal oh, wow. in Cambodia against um, Doik, Comrade Doik, who was the first person to be brought to trial representing the genocide, two to three million lives lost. The first person after 30 years to be brought to trial and I testified in the in the war crime, uh, in the tribunal, faced Doik and um, told him what I thought of him. And that was an interesting process. Uh, and along the way, gave a victim statement. And But in preparation for that, I, I, I looked for symbols. Um, I got some soil from our backyard, our home that the Kiri grew up and played with. And, and got some water from the river in front of our house and some seawater from the sea that we fished in and had fun in and um, sand from the beach and I mixed it and took it in a jar and I took it to Cambodia and I went to the prison, got a monk from the um, temple nearby and he came along and blessed the contents of the jar and I spread some of those contents around the prison grounds. I also went to a place on the streets of Cambodia and one of the interviews I had interviewed a guy who was a guard and had witnessed a Westerner taken outside the prison, um, made to stand in tires, petrol thrown and set alight. No. And I'm pretty sure that was Kerry. Oh. Um, and I and I performed a, the finishing part to that ceremony and spread the rest of the remains of that, you know, of his home there. Now. Um, <clears throat> You know, symbolism ceremony is really important, I think, and yeah. it, um, yeah, connected yeah. to my bro. Yeah. Um, mm. The grief doesn't go, man. Yeah, so it, um... Did your brother ever talk back to you during those moments that you were talking um, to him? Uh... <clears throat> I don't know, I, you know, we made this film, and in making the film that was such a big undertaking to even start it. But at one point I shelved it, I shelved the program, you know, we worked on it for about a year, or a little under a year, and then I shelved it, said nah, mm. nah, stuff it, I'm not going to go Too on. much? Yeah, for a variety of reasons, but anyway, at one point I was just, I just knew it just didn't seem right, and for, went for about six months and it stopped it, and at one point I decided I wanted to ask Kerry, <laughs> and I, you know, I was in the house alone. And uh, our bedroom is connected to the um, lounge, and in the lounge we have a fireplace. And it was midwinter. It was about two or three in the morning, I think. And I'd woken up, just frustrated as heck, and and uh, yeah, I just wanted a sign. And the fire burst to flame next door, and I saw the reflection up, and usually the doors sort of open. I saw this shadow, you know, this light flicker up onto the walls and ceiling, 
in my room next door and I went, whoa, and that, because the phone had been out for a couple of hours. And of course, you know, you could argue, you know, with what happened to him, and I'm almost certain he was, um, you know, Sorry. in the tyres. Mm. And uh, so that was the thing, mm. right, okay, you yeah, know, we've got to get on with this. Mm. Yeah, so we made That's this film, beautiful. and it's beautiful. Oh my god, it's a beautiful film. It's so powerful. How can we get a hold of it's that? Inspiring. Um, I think it's on Amazon Prime. Okay. Um, to the DVD, I can. I've got the DVDs. I'm the only <laughs> person. Our distribution's pretty rubbish. But uh, <laughs> on, you can contact me via my website, robhamill.co.nz, um, and uh, just email me, and I can organise take it from there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway. So you've had grief, you know, I don't know if you know, but this whole project's inspired by the loss of my brother, who's seven mm. years older than me. Yes. And um, you don't hear people talking a lot about the experience of siblings dying. Yeah. And, um, but, but now I didn't realize about um, John, John mm. but we have Carrie and... A sister as well? Yeah, so I lost my sister last year. Wow, so and, sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank Are you. your parents still alive? No, no. Mum yeah. died in 03 and Dad died in 11. Just as we are about to, the film was about to be released, actually not long before he died. And um, so he never got to see the film, but he was involved a little bit in the filming of it. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and Sue is, Sue's in the film. She's a beautiful little cameo. But um she she became ill um several years ago and um yeah it rocked me i mean she was my best friend mm. you, you know she never judged me she was always there and she's my next elder sibling i'm the youngest in the family and um she looked after me when mum was telling me off sue would cry yeah you know absolutely. to take away the, the anger from yeah and and there's lots of stories of sue doing that for me you know, so there was a beautiful thing there. You know, I shared stuff with her that I would just st blokey stuff, you know, with my sister. And then that was gone. She was like, even when we weren't seeing each other, she was still there somewhere. Right, to, right. If I had to pick up the phone. Yeah. And that's a real shock that we experience, isn't it? When yeah. that person's not there. Yeah. And yet the, the beautiful thing is she is still there. Yeah. You know, it's just we, it's a choice actually. If yeah. we're, she is still there and your sibling is still there. And it's just in a different it depends what you believe you know if you're an atheist through and you know point black then okay they've gone period full stop mm, mm. uh i don't personally believe that I, mm. I think there's something else going on and um <coughs> this is to reinforce you know life is short Absolutely. you know you gotta if you want to do if you want to have a crack at something have a crack you know mm. timing's important of course but just do everything if it's your real if it's your passion if you want to have a go, do yeah. it. Don't just don't wait till tomorrow, and and that is actually what's stimulating part of our adventures we are undertaking right now. And again, it's connected very strongly with my family, siblings, and my parents. We're, we're sailing. We're well. We're off to sail the world. Um, yeah. And we've been sailing for. We bought a yacht. My wife and I, Rachel, a few years ago, learned how to sail it. Is real crash course. And uh, we've got our boys. We're taking our boys. Uh, you know, no out of school. Schools. Schmall, um, <laughs> and, and you know, educating outside the four walls, um, mm. and you know, look, every parent wants to grow healthy, happy, well adjusted, culturally aware, empathetic children, don't they? We Absolutely, all want to do that, yeah. we're just choosing to do it with, um, with this adventure. Into the space, into the great wide open, God only knows we try.